All right, hello everyone and welcome to our um, theme two of the Honor Study Topic Zoom. Tonight's theme is Natural and Constructed Environments. And our topic question is, how will the ever-changing environment affect future generations and the surroundings around them? And tonight's special guest host is the one and only Susan Edwards, who is the Honors Program Council Chairperson. So welcome, Susan. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you to the Illinois Regional Alumni Association. I think what you're doing and sharing each of the themes and inviting people to present on them is really impressive and wonderful. And I know the Illinois region has to really appreciate all the work you do. Um, I know I, I'm impressed and all of a sudden headquarters are impressed with what the Illinois Regional Alumni Association does. So thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to talk about theme two, the honor study topic. Um, and I want to harken back to Barbara Ebert's talk last week, just for a second. Um, our 2021, 2020, 2021 honor study topic is to the seventh generation inheritance and legacy. And Nicole mentioned that we're looking at theme two, natural and constructed environments tonight. I'm gonna to show you um, a dozen examples of, of how to look at it. They are not the exhaustive dozen that you can look at. I just kind of thought of them as the dirty dozen um, of different constructed environments, natural environments, and then some combinations of those two things. Now I wanna point out that when you look at a theme like theme two, the natural and constructed environments, it's always with a lens that you're looking at the honor study topic. You're always going back to the, to the seventh generation, the inheritance and legacy. That's one reason that the research question that the Alumni Association came up with is such a good one because it acknowledges theme two, but it also acknowledges that there's a bigger picture in the honor study topic. And that's exciting and absolutely how you should be doing it when you're looking at your honors and action projects. So let's take a look at some of these, um, these examples. I'm gonna start with some natural environments examples, move to some that are, are a combination of natural and constructed, and then talk about some constructed environments. So the overarching question for theme two, in addition to the research question that the Illinois Regional Alumni Association came up with, um, is to what extent are natural and construction, constructed environments fluctuating and how can we intentionally interact with them to affect our legacy? So that's a really broad question and um, you wanna use that to actually see if you're in the right theme. You know, if not, it's all cool, you can move to another theme. But if you notice that the question that Nicole posed was really well situated in theme two, so it's, um, it's a, a really perfect way to do this, but always keep this, this question in mind. It will let you know if you're in the right place. This bird, by the way, is um, native to, to Africa. And I think it's just one of the prettiest birds on the face of the earth, which is why it's here with us tonight. So I wanna start with California wildfires. And, and I, am, I pick California particularly, of course, there are wildfires in Utah and Arizona and, and all over the West right now. Uh, certainly, this is a natural environment and wildfires are a natural part of the environment. In fact, they're healthy for forests. These fires aren't really healthy, but in the, the sort of normal scheme of things, they can be really healthy. California particularly, you know, it has some some issues. Um, you know, they, there's been some criticism of them in their forest management. Um, there is probably some of that, although they really do work hard to manage their forests. The interesting thing about their particular situation is that about 33 million acres of forest, um, out of those 33 million acres, 57% of them are actually owned by the federal government. California only owns about 3% of the forest. So, you know, when the criticisms come of, of that managing the forest, um, a lot of that criticism, criticism is actually going to the federal government. Um, whether or not that's fair, it's something to discuss if you're looking at theme two and inheritance and legacy. 
Um, and then the other thing, you know, Gavin Newsom, who's the governor of California, has said, look, this is, this is about climate change, the fact that things are hotter and drier, um, and that the Santa Ana winds are coming in um, stronger, and that has an impact on the environment. Um, and climate change, of course, is really, really an important natural environments issue for inheritance and legacy. There have certainly been climate changes before, some of them, you know, pretty catastrophic, the catastrophic, excuse me, if you like dinosaurs, for example. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that some of this, or maybe all of it, depending on your, your point of view and looking at the science, is, is human made. It's certainly one of the things that humans can make some changes in how we, we look at the environment, um, including wildfires in California, and make those changes to really have an impact on future generations. One of the things on reading about the fires that really struck me was that we haven't done a lot with infrastructure federally in a long time. And California hasn't necessarily done some infrastructure um, upgrades that they need to do. And one of the reasons that the wildfires were so deadly for a number of towns, and this is true not just for California, it's true in other places of the West as well, is particularly in areas that you know, are not big cities, but they're, they're smaller places. Very often there's just one road in and one road out of the place. That's catastrophic when you have these wildfires that have grown very large and the wind is carrying them and firefighters are working really hard to help get people out, but they're so, the fires are so fast that people get trapped where they are. So one of the legacy issues might be to look at how do you change that? How can you get legislators, state and local um, and federal legislators to talk about infrastructure, to talk about roads, and, and look at the possibility of having more than one road in and out of a place to help people be able to get safely out of where they are. Um, there are lots of other issues with, with wildfires as well. Um, I live in Houston, Texas. We, we certainly had for years drought conditions which fuel wildfires. Fires. Now we actually have had a lot of rain and, and in a place like Houston and a natural environment that's been built on and there's a lot of concrete now, we're very much like Los Angeles in the way without the pretty beach or the nice weather. Um, but other than that, very much like Los Angeles, and uh, the, the water has no place to go. And so, you know, if you look at those kinds of issues, inheritance and legacy, and what you can do about environmental issues, um, looking at these weather events can be really important. Um, Illinois, I think, is probably more prone to, to earthquakes than to the wildfires or to, like in Houston, um, rain events and wind events um, like Harvey, for example, and hurricanes that can come into Houston. But you can do this locally as well, and there's so much information online and so much academic information about natural environments and weather events and whether they are getting um, harsher, whether climate's driving this, you know, what are kinds of things you can do. It's really rich for looking at um, natural environments. And I think you make a really good point on the uh, the California wildfires about having you need to have one you need to have more than one way in and one way out because if you think about it, for example, the National Guard that had to go in there, the three helicopter pilots had to go in there and rescue all those people. Yes. Now maybe they wouldn't have had to put themselves in that much danger had there been multiple ways in and out of that area where they were at and trapped. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Ray and. You know, the, the thing that's sort of different about fire um, than a hurricane, for example, is that we now have the technology um, that we can track hurricanes and we know approximately where they may go and, and what might happen. With wildfires, they're unpredictable. So if you only have that one way in and one way out and you don't leave um, early on, and for some people, that's a matter of money. You know, it's a matter of resources. Maybe there are no family members around. There's no place that they have to go. Maybe the place they go is, is no better. So the fact that it comes up so quickly 
is it's a real issue. And I think, I think it's one that's really um, important and interesting. And, and I think chapters could take a look at the, the interconnection between natural environment, weather events, and infrastructure, of course, which is looking at the um, constructed environments. But a, a second one that I, I really thought about, because I saw this in the, the news um, last week, and I, I try when I'm talking with people to, to look at news, the news and see, well, what's, what's up? What's there with the honor study topic and, and themes? And one of the things that caught my eye was that researchers are looking now at, at Venus, which is the planet that is uh, closest to, I was going to say the United States, Earth. <laughs> it's, it's Friday night. Um, it's closest to Earth, and, and we—it um, has you know, has been explored before. The Russians in the early 1960s reached Venus, and and basically they would expected to find forests and oceans and things like they might find on Earth. They didn't find that. Um, they found instead, um, you know, an atmosphere that really didn't seem conducive to life. But very recently, scientists are looking at. Venus, and they think that they may have found um, a chemical that actually uh, could have some type of life form in the clouds over Venus. So the sort of beautiful white um, things. It, it, this looks a little bit like granite to me, <laughs> with the, the marbling in there. But those are, those are clouds. And they found phosphine. And it, for humans, it's poisonous. So we could not go to Venus at this point and breathe this in. It also is really smelly. So it's, it's a poisonous gas that you know is there and, and you shouldn't breathe it in as a human. But what they're finding is that they think there might be some sort of organism that has hard shells that allows the organisms to, to live in this kind of environment. And, and so possibly there is some life on Venus. They're not absolutely sure yet, but it's in, intriguing. And you know, one of the things the scientists talked about was when you look at this natural environment is that really people have always looked at the heavens. You can see that in, in Greek and Roman writings and uh, Arab, ancient Arab writings. I mean, you, you can see that people look to the heavens and wanted to know what's up there. Um, and so there's, there's a big inheritance in how people have looked at the heavens, how they've explored, what are the possibilities. And I think there's also incredible legacy because of the technology that's being developed to be able to look at the stars. Even personal telescopes are, are really amazing now. I mean, you can purchase one for your home that's um, really powerful. And you can see if you don't live in a big city where there's brownout, um, you can see a lot of stars with them, which is very cool. And one of the things that's, that's happened over the course of, of what we've inherited that the scientists talked about was that, you know, there's always in our imaginations, there are always elements of, of reality. And the example they gave in the articles I read was that, you know, when we look at Martians, for example, if you ask children to draw Martians, how do they draw them? You guys all know this. They're what color? Green. Green. Martians are green. Um, and they have little horns usually, but they look like humans largely. And so that's, that's really typical of how we, we look at the heavens, that we, we imagine that there are beings there maybe, that they, they're going to be you know, looking like they're human, they're going to be slightly different because that's how people use their imaginations. But in this case, um, they're not looking at it being human life, they're looking at it being something um, you know, very different. The exciting thing for me in inheritance and legacy and looking at the heavens, looking at planets, looking at um, the comet, that was near Earth all through August, which was really fun to see, is that our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and if you look beyond that to the seventh generation, are gonna know so much more about the galaxy than we currently know. And it, it's gonna be quite remarkable to see, you know, maybe what someone like I grew up with um, and, and what the people who come after us are gonna know about the universe and what that's going to mean for them as they look at natural and constructed environments. Um, as a, a side note, I was watching CBS Sunday Morning last week and they had a segment on 
the fact that, that the United States, the West in general, but the United States has so many cities or urban areas now, and they, there's so much light that it's really difficult to see um, a lot of the stars and, and the heavens. And the one uh, scientist who, who was featured and it said, you know, he grew up looking at the Milky Way and you just had to walk outside your home and see that, you know, sort of that inheritance that we didn't have quite as many people, so the population smaller, that we didn't have the lights necessarily that we have now. And um, they, they researched it and found that there's, there are some places in the middle of Idaho where you can still go and it's dark enough at night that you can still see the Milky Way and you can see um, the, the environment in terms of planets and stars and, and everything that's out there in the galaxy. So if you are looking for something fun to do, it's harder for me to get there from Houston, but you know, from Illinois, not so bad really, um, zipping over toward the West. So I think that don't forget that, you know, there are lots of, of environmental, natural environments on Earth, but you also can look um, to space and you can look to the heavens and see that there are natural environments there as well. And I think that you can also look at constructed environments in terms of what it takes to get people into the atmosphere. You can look at satellites, for example, and how many of them we have up in space right now. Um, you can look at the space station. There's so many ways to sort of connect the natural environment and constructed environments um, with the Earth. So let's look at, well, that was good timing. Humans and, <laughs> humans and dogs. I will tell you, that's Lily. Um, the, the dog who's pictured in this this photograph is actually our other dog who is not barking currently. So Lily's maybe looking at the screen and saying, why is it not me? Um, I'm pretty. So one of the things that caught my eye, there was some really interesting work done by some scientists who are looking at the connection between humans and dogs. And they've been looking at this for a while, but there's a group at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln that had been looking at dogs um, and looking at their domestication over the past 15,000 years, and particularly since the Victorian era. So sort of the early to mid 19th century through the very beginning of the 20th century, where it became really fashionable to get designer dogs um, and to, to really breed dogs. So they were designer dogs. I will say that the beautiful Hillary here is a rescue. She is still gorgeous and wonderful um, and 14 years old. Um, so that's a happy thing, but she even is a mixture, probably not by science, um, probably by whatever her mama and daddy did, um, but she's part Chow and part German Shepherd. And I mention that because one of the things that the scientists were looking at at um, University of Nebraska was, was whether as humans are breeding dogs and as they're sort of altering their looks and altering how they behave, I mean, Hillary and her behavior is all shepherd. When we go for a walk, you know, she goes with us and she has a really good time. On the way home, she always leads. It's always like, follow me. I know the way home. Um, and it's, it's always sort of fascinating to watch that behavior in her. So they said that, yeah, you can, you can see that when you're studying animals and that, that humans have bred different types of dogs to be hunters, to, to be shepherds, to, to, um, to really work with, with waterfowl. I mean, there are lots of different things. And they've also bred them to, uh, to be pretty. I mean, to sort of be what they hope their, their dogs are going to look like. But what this group also did, they took MRIs of dogs, 63 dogs, and they found that not only did their, their looks change, dogs' looks change over time, but their brains are actually changing. So the, the biology of dogs, and I see Lori Garrett in there, she probably knows a lot about this, but um, that they're, they're thinking that dogs' brains are changing as a result of their connection to humans. Um, so part of that, that natural environment, also a little constructed environment, if you're you know, creating designer dogs. There is some caution with the study. Um, it, it worked, the scientists worked with 63 dogs but they weren't doing the tasks that the dogs were bred to do. So example, if they were doing an MRI on Hillary, they weren't doing it while she was actually shepherding people home. 
And so there, there's some caution there. Um, they also really weren't looking at working dogs. They were looking at dogs that basically were domesticated and lived in homes and, and were pets. And so there's, there's still more work to do. But if you're looking at inheritance and legacy, we've, we've inherited uh, the idea of domesticated dogs. We've inherited the idea, certainly in the West, that dogs are, are part of a human's family, right? Um, we call our dogs the girls. Um, and so, you know, I don't think we're alone. I think that's a fairly common thing that people can see domesticated animals as part of their, their families. Um, and, and we changed as a result of that, but dogs very definitely seem to be changing over time because of the, the breeding. And there are lots of interesting things to see there um, and lots of legacy issues. You know, are we harming dogs in doing that? Um, are we creating designer dogs that maybe are less healthy than mutts, for example? My, my beautiful Hillary is a mutt. Um, she's, she's strong, she has outlived what the life expectancy is for either of the breeds that, and she may have more <laughs> breeds in there, but either of those breeds, she's, she's a really healthy dog. Um, and she hasn't had the biological problems, the things like hip dysplasia that German shepherds typically have, for example. So, you know, so is it better to have dogs that are interbred in terms of, of being mutts and, and so they, they strengthen? Um, the, the dogs, or are we creating these, these purebred dogs that um, aren't quite as healthy? Uh, there are questions about rescuing animals versus puppy mills. You know, if you're looking at research and looking at honors in action, there are some interesting um, things to do there. But in terms of, of natural environment and, and looking at constructed environments, I think humans and dogs can be a really interesting topic. If you are cat lovers, you can do the same thing um, with cats. There are, there's lots of research on whether cats think and whether, you know, they, um, they think who are humans. Um, there, there's some of, I, kind of interesting research over the past maybe five years that suggests that cats just see us as big cats um, who feed them, which is always really <laughs> interesting um, to look at. So um, if you are a, an animal lover, this honestly topic has something for you um, in theme two. So here's a, a connection between um, the natural and constructed environment. And I picked the, the Philadelphia Zoo. Zoos are really interesting to study no matter what with theme two, because there are lots of people who object to zoos. They object to having animals in cages, but you also have people who say, you know, zoos do a lot of work with endangered species, with um, breeding with, with really trying to take care of, of animals and that they've created environments, natural environments, or they've constructed natural environments to really um, house the animals, you know, in, in something like what their natural environments might be. And so one of the things that Philadelphia did, which is, it's so cool when you go there, these, these I guess they do look like cages, but they're, they're sort of runs, you know, that you might have for dogs where they can, can move around and all sorts of primates. Um, this is showing orangutans, but the image, but all sorts of primates, when you go to the zoo, if you look up, you can see them wandering around that part of the zoo. So, you know, they're kind of watching the humans as they come in and they're interacting with one another in these. And the zoo did this because they thought that, you know, the animals maybe were a little bored, that this would help primates, um, they're smart, uh, to move around, get some exercise, get out of, of some of the other constructed environments that they have in the zoo. And it's been really successful. And again, as a visitor to a zoo, it's really interesting to see. Um, another note, just looking at, at natural and constructed environments, one of the things that zoos have reported over the past few weeks, um, it's been in the news, that because humans haven't been in zoos because of COVID-19, that one of the things they're noticing is that animals are actually lonely um, and, and exhibiting some emotions that they think might be some loneliness because they're used to having humans around looking at them all the time. Um, that's something that I don't know as much as I love animals that I would have thought of um, as happening, but there are connections and zoos have some really interesting things that, that you can study about natural and constructed environments, um, whether or not you believe in them, because there are, there are people 
on all sides of the issue and lots of academic sources you can look at um, to get varied viewpoints, which is one of the things you want to do with honors in action. And so um, humans need those environments as well. Um, Central Park in New York City, it's about 800 uh, acres in New York City, which is, is quite large. And it, it goes from the Upper West Side to the Upper East Side, or I guess <laughs> the Upper East Side to the Upper West Side. So it depends on which way you're going. But um, it you know, spans that upper part of Manhattan. And it was developed in the 19th century, um, really looked at originally in the 1840s. Central Park is actually finished um, in 1857, but it's, it was a desire to have a natural environment in this sort of major constructed environment. So not so different from if you're looking at the zoos and, and kind of constructing environments in which the um, primates in this case can thrive. When people were looking at New York City, they're saying, you know, cities were, were pretty, pretty dirty, they were pretty loud, they were crowded. Um, there were a lot of things that, that didn't feel natural to humans necessarily, so they wanted people to have a place to move into the world that was part of nature. Um, and if you, you know, been to New York City, I know many of you have that um, there aren't lots of trees when you're walking down the street. I mean, it, there's much more concrete than there is streets. So when you see Central Park, it's just sort of this oasis. It's beautiful. And there are other parks in New York City as well. But this is sort of the big one. It's a national historic site. It's also a, a New York um, scenic site. So it, it's a protected site now, which is another interesting thing if you look at, at theme two and how you protect spaces like this. And over the years, it, it's become really important as a place where New Yorkers can go to do things like ice skate. There is a zoo um, in Central Park. There are ponds in Central Park. There are theaters in Central Park. So there are so many things to do. And, and if you look at even new developments, um, all the, the new development in Houston, for example, is in the western part of Houston, going toward Austin and San Antonio. And when you see uh, the builders coming into this area of Houston, they, uh, they'll, they'll tear down every single bush or tree or anything else to build some rather large houses. But then they also build natural environments. They'll, they'll build lakes. They'll, um, they'll have bike paths and walking paths and they'll replant flowers and things so that people have some some places they can go they're they're constructing the natural environment even though they have torn down part of the natural environment to do that you know new york city was like that one time too and, and frederick law olmsted designed this park and they created um this this amazing park in the city and you see other cities um doing the same thing. Um, Chicago has lots of really beautiful parks and uh, is not the only place in Illinois that does. So I, I think it's, um, it's pretty wonderful. I should mention that the park, by the way, has a $65 million annual budget. So it does take a lot of money to protect um, a natural environment within, you know, the constructed largest city in the United States. Um, most of it comes from a nonprofit organization. So it isn't the, the city that's paying for most of the upkeep, but it, um, it can be very expensive to do this as well. And, and so cities and, and states and developers who do this um, really have to plan for how, how this is gonna be paid for and how people are going to take care of it. One thing along that line, Susan, you were talking about Chicago and Cook County, Illinois is, is known for having just an incredible amount of green spaces, very well planned out. And I live downstate, as you know, and the hummingbirds, I put out hummingbird feeders and get maybe two hummingbirds during the summer and that's about it. And John is about 45 minutes east of me and just has dozens of them all summer. And I went to a seminar about hummingbirds a couple of years ago and the person presenting said, how many of you have tons of hummingbirds at your feeders? And, and nobody's hands went up. He said, that's because you live too far downstate. So we're on a migration route for the hummingbirds, but they prefer going up to Chicago 
because of all the botanical gardens and all the green spaces. So they go up there to do their, their for their main season. So we just get them. We have a few that'll just stick around, but otherwise we just get the ones that are migrating through. And that's the last thing you would think with us being rural, you'd think they'd be sticking around here, but they head for Chicago every year. And you can't blame them because Chicago is fabulous. Although she it has is. Advantage too. <laughs> but no, that, I mean, that's the kind of thing with theme too. You could look at migration patterns of hummingbirds and, and look at the fact that, wait a minute, you would think they would go to smaller places and they would go to rural areas and then look at the reasons they would go to Chicago. I mean, that's, that's an ideal and interesting thing to look at. Um, you, can, you can look at, at birds, you can look at um, bees. <laughs> That just sounds the birds and the bees. Um, <laughs> you can look at that and, and other types of, of you know, plants and, and things that are migratory or even moving. Um, Sonia Shaw has a, a new book. Her 2016 book, Pandemic, was, was really interesting. And, and she one of the things she said was to watch birds and migration, which will tell you something about the health for humans or coming things like pandemics. Um, and and she, she, she sort of nailed it, not the birds did this to us, but that that, that kind of thing can happen. Um, but she, her new book is talking about migration and, and what's happening as there's climate change and, and how plants and birds and butterflies and bugs and, and other kinds of things are migrating. And at first, uh, when she looked at some of the examples, she thought that it was just certain types of uh, beings and plants. Um, and, but then she looked, other scientists brought their research together and saw that, in fact, there are all sorts of species of plants and animals moving um, about 40 miles north of places um, over some time. So take a look at Sonia Shaw, too, because it's really, it's just uh, ripe for studying and looking at these things. And I love hummingbirds. That's reason enough to be in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> or 45 minutes north of Champaign Urbana. <laughs> hey, John. Um, another, this is a, a constructed uh, environment. And one of the things that, that caught my eye, this has really been a few weeks ago, but Michael S. Smith, um, who was the designer that the Obamas used in the White House, all, all presidents and first ladies used designers coming in to, to decorate the White House, and all of them get $100,000 to do that. There's, there's money set aside in the budget here. But he, he published a new book. It's, it's fascinating. It's, it's really interesting to look at inheritance and legacy here. And the White House is first used in 1800 by John and Abigail Adams. It wasn't finished at the time. Um, it cost about, at the time, in, in our money, about $288,000 to build quite a nice house for $288,000. Um, but if you look at it, of course, there are, um, in terms of constructed environments, there are lots of problems when you have a house that's over 200 years old. And so there are lots of things that first families and the people who work with the White House have to, have to take care of. But the other thing that Smith talked about, which I thought was really interesting for inheritance and legacy, and despite you have this incredible place that's part museum, and part family residence. So you have to design with the museum, there are strict guidelines for the type of paint you can use, the type of fabrics you can use, the kinds of art you can bring in, the furniture um, that's brought into the public spaces. And then uh, you, you have to take into account the family living there and what they want their spaces to look like. And it's, it's a really interesting book about what happens when you've got a public and private place in one, you know, that has this incredible inheritance, but also has a legacy and not so much the private residences, because of course that's going to change every four to eight years. But, you know, kind of marrying those two and, and constructing environments that are, that work for different types of families, but also, um, work for people who are coming through the White House, going to state dinners or meetings or actually just touring the White House. So I recommend it. And I think that you can look at other buildings. There, there are lots of buildings that are part um, museum and may have private functions as well. Um, I had mentioned Lincoln, Nebraska because of the, the study of, of dogs, but they also have uh, an interesting hospital complex sort of right in the middle of 
of Lincoln and um, that their hospital offices are in William Jennings Bryan's home, old home. Um, Bryan was a, a four-time presidential candidate who didn't win, so don't, don't scratch your head thinking, President Bryan, do I know him? You don't, because um, there never was a President Bryan, but it, it's sort of interesting to look at, here's this really important figure um, from Lincoln, Nebraska, um, and his, his house has to be preserved on some level, but it's also used as hospital offices. And so there, there, it doesn't have to be the White House you're studying, although you can study it, but you can look at um, those kinds of things where spaces have those different functions and when, when there are restrictions um, on how you can renovate and how you can construct environments. And it's, it's really interesting. Okay, um, HGT, the HGTV ification of not just the United States, HGTV is actually broadcast in 21 countries. And I, I wanted to put this one in here because I think one of the things that's happened, and I love, uh, I love HGTV, I should say that, because I'm gonna probably sound very critical of it. But if you watch HGTV, they're so powerful. They are the number three network in the United States. They, they are lag behind only Fox News and ESPN. And that's saying a lot wow. um, about HGTV. But, but by watching it, we all know, we have all become very, very um, accustomed to what we want in built environments, constructed environments, right? So if you walk into a house and you're looking to buy it, what are the things you want? I know you know this if you watch HGTV. You want an open floor plan? You want it to be light, you want hardwood floors, you want granite or, um, uh, oh gosh, my mind is blanking, granite or, um, I'll think of it, for your countertops, you want stainless steel, um, you want a place to entertain people. I mean, it's almost always the same thing over and over and over again. It's, it's and an interesting thing, if you look at the, the inheritance, most of us were of a certain age, um, the second half of baby boomers. Um, and uh, if you look at how we grew up, um, I, you know, I shared a room with my sister for 16 years. Um, we, we did not have our own spaces and our own televisions and our things. In fact, when I was a little girl, you got up and you had to go to the television and change the channel. <laughs> uh, so there are big changes, things that you know, we never want to do today. But you know, having a space that even was 2,000 square feet, was large. It was a pretty nice size house. If, if you look at what's happened, you know, in, inheriting that, it's, it's changing. Um, and I think the legacy is changing. HGTV has something to do with that, but people want space. You know, they want every child to have his or her own room. They want them to have um, their own spaces, preferably you know, everybody have their own bathrooms. Um, and I, it's always interesting to think about, well, what is going to be the legacy if you never have to share? Because we already don't share our music, right? I mean, not really. We can pick whatever we want. Um, we can watch what we want. I mean, you have to do some sharing. You know, if you live with somebody and you have one remote control, but you know, and, and you're all both watching the same TV. But we, we really don't have to watch things we don't want to watch. We don't have to listen to things we don't want to listen to if we all have our own spaces. I think one of the interesting questions, which I don't know if we can answer fully, but is what happens to institutions like marriage or institutions, uh, pe people living together. College campuses are already changing as a result of all this. Um, if you look at um, some colleges in Mississippi, we're really open about the fact that they are building single rooms to attract students that you know, students no longer want to share a bathroom, they no longer want to live in a dorm with somebody else as a roommate. That's a direct connection to be, between what we, we see as important environmental factors um, and, and we live. And, and I think that, um, that HGTV has had something to do with that. They've been around for about 25 years now, almost, and, uh, in some form, maybe not the form we see it now, and it's, it, they've had a profound impact on constructed environments and how we see um, inheritance and legacy. And I think they're gonna have some really interesting um, connections as we move forward to that, the legacy. 
and another so, dimension of that for here in central Illinois, we're in the ag belt. We have some of the richest farm ground in the world. And what we're finding is we have all these subdivisions popping up and people not only want the space in the house, but they want a nice sized yard. So they're taking prime farmland with amazing soil out of production to put up these huge McMansions with all this extra yard space. And that, that's another big concern is what happens when we keep eating up all the, the land that we can grow the crops and grow the food on so that we can give people these luxury homes. Yeah, absolutely. And that happened, um, not so much Houston, because Houston's never been um, farmland, it's, it's cattle, but in, in North Texas, um, in the Dallas area where some um, cities like Plano grew up and, and did the exact same thing, took this really fertile farmland. Um, you know, another issue if you, with all the subdivisions that are being built, um, if the homeowners association insists that you have pretty grass, there's, and you know, in terms of inheritance, um, I know because I, I live with someone who just rails at having to, um, to uh, edge all the time, <laughs> the homeowners association um, insists on it. Um, and, and so all the water that has to go into having a nice lawn, yeah. uh, all the work uh, has an effect on the environment. Um, as well as well as pleasure if you don't like edging. Um, so that, those kinds of things are perfect to look at inheritance and legacy and the choices that generations alive today are making in terms of natural and constructed environments. And you can do some amazing things in looking at the, these issues. Um, so you probably heard of COVID-19, <laughs> Maybe um, that you know is is one of those natural and constructed environments. You, you certainly could look at uh, coronavirus as part of a natural environment, um, and and how how the the viruses develop, how they spread. You know, there are all sorts of really interesting things you could do. You could look at them in other themes as well, but but you could look at them here. But one of the things I think is is really interesting is that um, all nations really who've been affected by COVID-19 are trying to figure out how do you get people uh, back in schools? How do you get them back in businesses? And I thought that this image of the Korean classroom, South Korean classroom was really an interesting one because you know, they all have masks on. They've got the, the surround, um, the desks so that it, people, if they're talking to them, are not gonna be spraying things on the humans that are, who are there. It does not stop you from looking at your phone very clearly um, while you're in the classroom. And they've got people spaced not quite six feet apart, I, I don't think here, but in terms of being able to breathe on someone or cough or do something like that, they're, they're spaced apart. Our school systems are gonna have to do some of the similar things um, to, to get people back, uh, back to school, back into businesses. I know Texas is opening up, um, Illinois I'm sure has, um, maybe more sanity when it comes to it. I'm sorry, Texas, for saying that. Anybody from Texas listening to this recording, I apologize. But um, Texas isn't the same state when it comes to that, let's just say. Um, and, and how you do this so people are protected. Um, the students, if you, you look at college campuses, um, lots of them are virtual, but you know, a lot of campuses opened and then they've had to quarantine people again. Um, the, you know, the football season has started. If you're looking at colleges and universities and a number of, of teams have had to stop um, and, and postpone games because people have tested positive. And it's, it's really tough because we've never sort of taken it in a federal way very seriously and had the same restrictions everywhere. That's part of the constructed environment if you look at the Constitution as a constructed environment and, and how Americans um, see themselves and how, how we look at rugged individualism versus collectivism. Both were part of founding documents that led to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. We, sent, we tend to go on the side of, of the rugged individualism, which makes it very difficult to look at these natural and constructed environments surrounding um, surrounding a virus like this. It brings me to the internet and because these two things are connected. Um, the internet is a constructed environment. You know, social media is constructed envi constructed environment. Um, when you, you look at those connections, 
The reason it's important right now is that one of the things that the coronavirus and COVID-19 particularly is showing us that there's a, the digital divide in this country, it's also in other countries as well. But if you're going to send people home to telecommute, if you're going to send people home to, to go to school and they have to rely on internet, there's a, a swath of the country that just can't rely on it. If you look at, at state Illinois, by the way, 81 to 90% of people have some access to relatively high powered internet. Um, so Illinois has, has done well. But there are states, Alaska, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi, um, where Phi Theta Kappa headquarters is, less than 50% of the people in the states have access to high-speed internet. That makes a COVID-19 environment really difficult, um, a constructed environment really difficult because it's so hard to be able to connect with people. Um, Nicole and I were, were talking earlier and, and saying that you know, both of us have been, you know, inside for months um, for, for our reasons. And if you at least have the internet as a lifeline or you have cable as a lifeline, um, that's one thing. If you have none of that um, and maybe you live alone and, and you, you don't have that connection, it could mean that you are going to get behind in classes. It, mean, it could mean that you, you can't telecommute. So you don't have work. Um, it can mean that you lose really important personal connections. So we have talked about infrastructure and talking about wildfires, but infrastructure for the internet is important as well. And we haven't done um, as good a job as we could do. It's very expensive to run fiber optics it's, um, and coaxial cables. And the result is that there are people in rural areas who pay between three and $400 a month to get a sort of slow speed internet. Um, when Jeff and I lived in Mississippi, we lived in a really small town of about a thousand people. And our, our cable guy, because I had to have um, internet because I telecommuted um, most of the time we were there, he would come into our house and he'd say, hey, can I look at your cable and your internet? Because we were the only people in town who purchased it. As I say purchased it, there were people who had cable, um, but not everybody actually um, purchased it there. But it was really interesting because we saw Tim a lot because Tim liked coming to our house. But it has implications, you know, that constructed environment has, um, has implications for legacy because you don't want people in areas where they don't have strong internet to not be able to work and to get into really serious financial situations. You don't want children to get behind in school. Um, and so there are things that, that we can do that can make a difference um, in terms of awareness or um, advocacy that can maybe lead to more infrastructure being built so that people have access to the internet. Again, we're finding with, uh, with COVID-19 that some of us forget that people don't have that access and, and yet it's, it's needed. All right, and finally, here's a congratulations. The Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox um, are in the playoffs this year. I'm thinking that there's some, yeah, celebrating in, <laughs> in um, Illinois. This is one of the things, I love baseball. So um, I watch this and in fact, um, I took a picture and had a, a cutout made for, uh, for Jeff, for I think it's in Astro Stadium right now and it's gonna be in my office later. But I love this image. I was, I was looking to, to get a, a good image that was either the Cubs or the White Sox. And this guy apparently somehow has 100 cutouts um, in the, the stadium for the White Sox. <laughs> I get it. What I love, um, you know, it's a, a really interesting constructed environment because one of the things that's happened for baseball this year and their 60 game season is that they, they really made um, it intentional to try to have an environment that, that helped the players sort of feel like they were in a normal stadium. So they pipe in noise, crowd noise, that of course gets you know, louder when the home team does something great and you can, <laughs> you can kind of hear noises of like people are talking and moving in the stadium. It's, it's really interesting to listen on um, the television or on the radio to it because it sounds like there are people in the stands. And then what um, almost every team, I, I think there was one team, and of course it has just gone out of my mind now that uh, did not do this, 
But what teams also did, their foundations started selling cutouts to put in the stands. Most of them between $50 and $100 per cutout. And they had fans take photos and send them uh, with payment um, to the foundations. And so they, they, made, uh, they made money for the foundations where they can, can have a legacy and do a, a lot of good. Um, but they also created this environment so a player can look up and, and see all sorts of people in the stands, especially this guy. Um, I didn't get his name. If you know him, you can let me know. Um, but I don't even know if he paid for all 100 of his cutouts, but I still love him for doing it. Um, because it's, it's pretty cool. But if you look at, you know, baseball has this incredible legacy in the United States. You can trace the history of immigration through baseball um, and, and really can trace uh, the history of towns and cities through baseball. If you, you look from uh, the 19th century and the 20th century into the 21st century. But it took some really creative thinking to construct environments that kept most players safe. There have been uh, baseball teams that have had to postpone games as well uh, because of COVID-19, but um, to, to keep that money coming for uh, foundations and, and for the, the teams um, and create the environments that, that brought fans in and engaged people. Um, and I think that, again, looking at ins inheritance and legacy, you could see some really interesting things. You know, football is going in another direction, actually bringing a percentage of, of bringing fans for a percentage of the seats in the stadium in. Um, and of course, it's a, it's a contact sport. So it's going to be interesting to watch. Um, but I think baseball really maybe was more successful in engaging people. And it, it would be interesting to see, could you do this um, on a campus? Or could you do something like this and, and have some, some interesting projects after you've done your, your research for this. And um, while I am not rooting for the Chicago White Sox or the Cubs to win this year, my apologies, although I love both teams. <laughs> if they do win, I will cheer you on. So I, I want to thank you. I know hopefully we have a couple of minutes for, for questions or for um, discussion. That was my, my dirty dozen. There are so many ways to look at theme two. Um, in natural and, and constructed environments. And I hope that some of the things that I picked in the dozen I looked at were things maybe you hadn't thought of. Or, and and uh, I really appreciate the comments by Ray and Lori in, in giving you some other ideas for things you might be able to look at. Everything can be done virtually. Honors and action can be done virtually. I, I really do think that there can be um, a, a broader and, and a deeper impact using uh, the internet, using uh, outreach, using the virtual tools that you have. And we really appreciate the fact that you are willing uh, to engage in looking at the honor study topic and engage in honors in action and really thank the Illinois Regional Alumni Association for just planning out these discussions about each of the themes in the honor study topic. Um, bravo. Well, thank you for doing this. We greatly appreciate it. <laughs> sure. It's my honor. I noticed we have uh, somebody who joined us. Sean, if you're on, do you have any questions regarding theme two for Susan? Um, not really. I wanted to thank you, though, because it really did help me understand it a bit better. I was... This is one that I kind of struggled with a bit, getting a grasp on what could be done, and your presentation definitely helped uh, clear that up for me. Oh, thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. Fantastic. That's why we're doing this. It's to help out our members, to help out the members of Texas or anywhere, really. I mean, this is going to be posted on our YouTube channel and we'll have it on our Facebook. So if you want to share it to other regions, go ahead. And that's the whole point was to bring attention to the themes and really show how you can really dig into a theme if you know exactly what to do and if you come up with a good question and if you can expand on that question like Susan has done. So bravo for that. Thank you. But if you do have questions as you leave or if somebody's watching this recording and has questions, there's my email address. Please feel free to contact me and I'm, I'm happy to engage with you and talk about the honor study topic and theme tour, any of the seven themes. 
Um, but again, thank you so much for inviting me and I really appreciate all you're doing to promote the honor study topic. Well, thank you. Um, as a thank you, uh, Ira has a store on Cafe Press and what we would like to do is